my goodness, what a crowd, what a crowd. And it looks like we've got matching shirts and twins and parents and maybe grandparents, and I'm so happy you're here. I have to tell you that I spent a lot of my time as a young girl in the library. My mother would go to the library every week, and she would pick out a book, and I would pick out a book. So I've read many of the books in this library. There's so many, there's so many, and even more now. So what I'm going to tell you about today is a little bit about my life. I thought you might be interested in how people get to space and stuff like that. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I wrote a book. Because some of you may want to write in school or write down in a journal or maybe write a book someday. So we'll talk about that too. So next slide, Laura, my trusty assistant here. This is me. I'm a little girl. I am about six years old, and that's my little sister next to me. And I don't know if this is something that you all do, but um, I made doll clothes. And here I am cutting out the material to make doll clothes. And you can see the little clothes that my sister has in her hand. And um, I thought my mother was very brave <laughs> to let me use scissors at six, especially kind of big scissors. But you'll find out that um, knowing how to use scissors helped me later on in life. Next slide. So I went from, Bur from Murfreesboro, Tennessee to a crazy place. Most of the children won't know about this, but I would bet that some of the people remember the University of California at Berkeley in the 1960s. It was called Berserkly because it was so crazy out there. And can you imagine a little girl, 17 years old, being dropped off in a place like this that had all these crazy things going on. They were protesting the Vietnam War. There were um, people that um, wanted the university uh, to give up some of its buildings and make parks out of them. They even had something going on called women's lib, women's liberation. And they began to demand that women and girls have the same opportunities as men did. And most of the girls don't believe that, you know, there were just some things that girls weren't allowed to do back then. And so the women's liberation movement came along, and I'm sure that some of the adults remember that and perhaps benefited from that, as I did, as I went on after college. Well, I decided when I was in college that if they were going to give women chances to do anything they wanted, that maybe I would do something that was rather unusual for a woman back then. I decided that I wanted to be a doctor. They didn't let many women into medical school. They didn't think that women could be good doctors. And I'll bet that some of you have women doctors. There are a lot of them around here. But back then, there weren't very many. But I decided, well, maybe they would let me into medical school. For the adults, they were letting fewer than 5% of medical school classes be female. Luckily, when I applied to the University of Tennessee College of Medicine, back here in Tennessee, I was coming home from California, hoping to do okay in Tennessee, they took the biggest class of women they ever had uh, in medical school. We had a class of 100 in medical school, only six were women. That was the most they had ever taken, if you can believe that. Now the classes are half or more of women. Next slide, Laura. So here I am, my white coat on, and so I became a doctor. I went through medical school, that took four years, and decided at the end of that time that not only did I want to be a doctor, but I wanted to go into a field that there were hardly any women in. I decided that I want to be, wanted to be a surgeon so I could operate on people and make them well. Now, I was the first woman they had ever allowed into the surgery residency at the University of Tennessee, so it was kind of unusual. But, you know, I had to 
to do my best and try hard to prove that women could do that. One of the obstacles I had to overcome is that you may notice that I'm kind of little. To operate at the operating table, I had to stand on a box so everybody else didn't have to bend over. But that would work okay. You know, even though you're little, it doesn't matter. You can figure a way to do anything you want. If you're a girl, you can do whatever you want these days because of the way things happened back when I was growing up. Next slide. But you know, I had always dreamed that maybe I would like to go into space. When I was growing up, some of the adults may remember, there was a thing called Sputnik. It was this satellite that orbited the Earth and it was the first thing that we had ever sent into space. And my daddy one night took me out when I was about 10 years old, and we went out in the yard, and he said, look at that little light blinking across the sky. And I didn't know what that was. I thought maybe it was an airplane, but it was going too fast. And my daddy said, that is the world's first satellite. And the Russians put it up there and we need to beat the Russians in space. So you are watching the beginning of a new era. It's called the Space Age. And you know, when a grown-up tells you that you're seeing the beginning of something that might take place when you got older, you're kind of impressed by that. So all you parents, you never can tell what you'll show your kids that will attract their interest, and they may go on to follow that field for a long time. So I thought, you know, if I could ever get to go to space, I would like to take the chance. But you know what? They didn't let women be astronauts back then. The astronauts were all men. They were all between five foot seven and five foot ten. And I knew I was never going to be five foot seven. And so I was never going to be a man. So there wasn't going to be a chance for me. And we got to see people go into space, Americans go into space. It was kind of a race with the Russians. Some of you will remember that. We were trying to do things that the Russians were doing and catch up with them. Well, we saw the first Americans orbit the Earth. Then we saw, um, we saw people living in space for longer periods of time. And eventually we got to see people land on the moon. And some of you may know that next month in July, we'll celebrate the 50th anniversary of people landing on the moon, and those people were American. So we were very proud of that. It is one of the things that our country has done in the past that we hope they will do again in the future that was really, a, as Neil Armstrong said, a giant leap for mankind. So um, I watched all that growing up. I could look at the moon and know that people were walking on it. And, it really interested me. And believe it or not, when the space shuttle was designed, you all may have seen pictures of the space shuttle, they decided that they could take non-pilots, people that weren't pilots, because there would be three people on the shuttle that would be in charge of flying the shuttle, and then there would be four people that would handle whatever the cargo was. They could be scientists or engineers. And so in 1977, they announced that in 1978, they were going to take a new group of astronauts, the largest group they had ever taken. They were going to take 35 people. And you know what? They announced that women could apply for the job. Oh, my goodness. When I found that out, I thought, well, you know, I had planned to be a doctor. I was almost finished with my training. But if I was ever going to try to make that leap, I was going to have to apply. So I didn't know where to apply, so believe it or not, I addressed a letter, NASA, Houston, Texas, and it got to the right people, and they sent me an application. So sometimes you have to try something, even if you don't think it'll work, but it's worth trying. So I tried, and I filled out all the paperwork, sent it back in, NASA called me up and asked if I wanted to come down for an interview, which I did. And believe it or not, I was the first woman that they interviewed. So they didn't quite know what to ask me, <laughs> and I didn't know what, quite to, what to answer them. Uh, but we did the best we could, and lo and behold, I got to be an astronaut.
Next slide. In that class of 35 new astronauts, they took six women. And I'll bet that some of you can figure out which one of those ladies is me. <laughs> Maybe the one with the blonde hair? Ah, yes. Maybe the one that's little? <laughs> yes, I was the littlest astronaut they had ever taken. But I knew I could overcome whatever obstacles came along, because I always had in the past. So I was very surprised and very excited that they were going to let me fly on that space shuttle. There were six of us in that class. You may recognize some of them. Next to me is Anna Fisher. Next to her is Judy Resnick, Shannon Lucid, Sally Ride, and Kathy Sullivan. So the six of us were in a group of 35 new astronauts, and we sort of had to figure out how we were going to succeed. One of the women who were um, in the leadership roles at the Johnson Space Center, we asked her, how can we succeed? And she said, use good judgment. That's a very important thing to remember your whole life. Use good judgment, because it'll usually get you where you want to go and keep you out of trouble. Um, anyway, there were 29 men in this class, and many of them were uh, pilots. Half the class was, were pilots. And um, they had to teach us how to fly the airplanes. So we got to know the pilots in our class. We all became friends and everything. And, um, you know, it, it was a nice group of people to be with. Next slide. One of the pilots was particularly nice to me. And uh, this is us kind of goofing off in something called the Zero-G airplane. That's a big airplane that's all empty inside, no seats. And it flies up and down like a roller coaster. And as you come across the top, like sometimes you experience a roller coaster, coaster when you raise your hands and your arms feel weightless, well, we could get about half a minute of weightlessness and we could float around. So here we are in the zero-G plane, and I'm playing around with this pilot friend of mine and holding him up like I'm Superwoman. So I really like this picture. Next slide. For another reason, too, because I married that guy. This is Captain Robert Gibson. Everybody calls him Hoot for some reason. That was his call sign in the Navy. And we were the first active astronauts to marry each other. Well, of course, that makes sense because we'd never had women astronauts before, <laughs> and so astronauts couldn't marry astronauts. But we did marry, and then about a year after we married, we had this little boy named Paul. And Paul likes to tell his friends that he was the world's first astro-tot. <laughs> and you kids know that kids or babies are called tots. So instead of being an astronaut, Paul was an astro-tot. And later on, we had two more. So there are very few astrotots in the world. There's, it's a unique uh, group of people, but there are a few. And uh, they all are very proud of that fact that they can be called astrotots. And so, next slide. Before too long, I had finished all my flying training and my science training and uh, had spent a, about a year and a half training to fly on the shuttle. And so I was assigned to a flight. This is my first flight. And I can tell you that launching in a space shuttle was one of the most amazing things you can imagine. You think you are prepared for it. They tell you what it's going to be like. And they have some simulators that jiggle you around. But believe me, when they, when they light the engines, it feels like you just sat on top of an explosion because there's lots of noise, lots of light outside. You're going really, really fast. The thing is shaking and your head is bouncing around inside the helmet that you have on. And at two and a half minutes, the boosters come off and then it's a much smoother ride. But I would bet that most of you cannot guess, even the grown-ups cannot figure out how long was it gonna take to go from launch pad to orbit. I have a hand there, how long did it take? Three days. That's a good guess. No, not correct. Yeah. Six days. Seventy days? Yes. A hundred days. Oh my goodness. I was going to get old if it took a hundred days. Eighty, ninety. 
you know what? It didn't take days. It didn't take 90 seconds is closer. It took two and a half minutes, and we were in space. And you know what the coolest thing was? You could undo your seatbelt, and you were weightless. You could float all around. I want you to imagine what it would be like instead of sitting on the floor, you could sit on the wall, or you could sit on the ceiling, and you could just fly every place that you wanted. It was the most amazing thing, and I hope that some of you someday will have the opportunity to be weightless for a period of time because it's so much fun. It was so much fun. But I want, wonder if you can figure out how you're going to eat in space. Is your food going to float? Yeah, the food floats, so you have to be careful. It will stick to your spoon because kind of, your spoon's kind of sticky and the food's sticky, but you have to be. Your, your spoon is going to float too, so you've got to make sure you're holding on to it. But it, was, it took some uh, learning to figure out what you could do and what was going to be a little different when you were in space. But we had a lot, a lot of, to of, of time to learn, but we had important things to do. Next slide. One of the things that we did on my first flight was to launch a satellite. This is looking at the back of the shuttle. You're looking out a window in the back of the cockpit at this big satellite. And look at the Earth up there. Is that not beautiful? Looking at the Earth was gorgeous. But this satellite came out, and it was supposed to go to a higher orbit. And it didn't turn itself on. We had to go try to rescue it. We did everything that we could, but we couldn't get the thing turned on. So a crew had to go up later and rescue that satellite and get it turned on. But it made for a very interesting flight and we had to learn to do things that we hadn't planned to do. So sometimes that happens when you do go somewhere and it doesn't turn out the way you thought. You have to figure out how to make it work. Next slide. This is the view out the window. Um, looking back at the tail, see the tail of the space shuttle up there? So you see that that sort of a can in the back, the big white thing with some, some patches on it. That's a laboratory in space. You might have a lab at your school where you go and do experiments and do things. Well, that was something called Space Lab. And we were going to do some tests on humans to find out what happens to people when they go into space. We wanted to make sure it was safe for people to go into space. What if you went to space and, and you had all kinds of problems and people couldn't stay in space for a long period of time. So as a doctor, I was very interested in learning what happens to people when they go into space. Next slide. And this is what our laboratory looked like. It looked kind of disorganized, right? You wouldn't want your um, lab in school to look like that. And what's really different about it? Remember I said it, you don't have to be on the floor? Look at the lady on the ceiling. We had our stowage lockers along the top. So when you needed to get something out, you could just float up like she has done, pull things out, close the locker, and we would get back to our business. But you can see it was a very busy time for us because we didn't have a lot of time. This flight only went up there for nine days, and we had a lot of science to accomplish. And we did. We found out some very interesting things happened to people. When you're no longer walking around on your bones, your bones begin to lose calcium and get weaker. You're no longer using your muscles. I'm standing here and I've got to be using my back muscles, my leg muscles, even my arm muscles to uh, work against gravity. And so your muscles in space get weaker because you're not really using them. You're just flying around and it's so easy to get around. You don't have to use your muscles. One thing I think the grown-ups would be interested in is that your inner ear gets messed up. As you get older, some older folks have trouble with their balance um, because they're having a little trouble sensing gravity. Well, imagine if there is no gravity and your inner ear, your balance, doesn't know where up and down are. And so as we went into space, we had to learn to rely on our eyes, our eyesight, rather than on our inner ear. Because you could close your eyes and you didn't know if you were right side up or upside down. So we had to relearn that when we got back, because <laughs> when we landed, we were all kind of shaky because our inner ear was so messed up. So a lot of things happen to people in space, but we've pretty much figured out how to take care of that so that people come back from long stays in space, even up to a year, in pretty good shape. 
we've learned what to do. Next slide. And of course, one of the best things that we did when we were up there was to be able to look out the window. For those of you who've had geography, you may recognize where we are. This is a Bible story in one picture. In the middle, you see the Sinai Peninsula. On the left is Egypt. And you see the, the line, the dark line going down the left side over there and into a delta into the Mediterranean, which is up at the top. That's where old Pharaoh in the Bible lived and where uh, a baby was fished out of the bulrushes by the daughter of the Pharaoh. So Moses was born over there on the left side of the picture. And for those of you who read the Bible, you know that Moses took some people out of Egypt and he wandered for 40 years in the desert. You can see the Sinai Peninsula there in the middle is all desert. And that's where Moses and all the Israelites um, wandered. And then over here on this side, you'll see the coastline. There's a dark area up there, right up there. That's Israel. That's where Jesus walked. So there is a Bible story, a big Bible story, um, in one picture. So it was amazing to see the earth. Now this is looking at the earth uh, when it's in daylight. But you know, the shuttle went around the earth every 90 minutes, if you can believe that. So we would see this, and then 90 minutes later we could see it again, or we would be a little bit in a different spot. And you would think that it wouldn't be very interesting to see the world at night. But the world was amazing when we were over on the other side of the world and could see it at night. Next slide. Oh my goodness. You can tell where the people are, right? You can see all the lights. The people have their lights on. And for those of you who have had geography, you will know that the country that sort of looks like a high-heeled boot is, what, Italy. I heard some people that have had geography. Italy. And if you really know what you're looking for, you can see where the big cities are, like Rome and Venice and all those places like that. And it was always fun to fly over a country like this, I first identify the country, and then try to figure out where, where those cities are. So you can see all the dark, where it's over water. This is the Mediterranean. You can see where there are only a few people and where there are a lot of people. So we could take pictures like this and understand. For those of you who know about North and South Korea, you can really tell where the border is because below in South Korea, there are lots of lights, like in Italy. North of the border, there are almost none. North Korea is not, um, they don't have an awful lot of lights turned on at night. Next slide. It's always good to come home. My first flight was seven days, my second was nine, my third was 14. This is my two-year-old son. He's waiting on the end of the runway in California, and that's mom coming home in the Space Shuttle Columbia. My husband took this picture, so it's very special. I have my book over here. It's the picture that's on the back cover of the book because it was such a special, special time, special picture. I could look out the window and see my little boy waiting for me. So um, very happy memories. Next slide. This is at the end of our space careers. That's my husband in the middle that you saw earlier. Um, and this is the end uh, of his fifth mission into space. I went into space three times. He went into space five times. People said, wasn't that fair? He got uh, unfair that he got more missions. Well, I had three kids along the way. And you couldn't fly in space if you were pregnant. So I had to take a little time out to have the kids. Over on the left is Julie. Um, I inherited Julie when I married my husband. And then we have our three Astro Tots down here. Paul, Dan that you saw on the end of the runway, and little Emily who turned 24 yesterday. So if I look a little tired, Emily was only two weeks old <laughs> when I had to go to Florida for my husband's flight. So um, 
It was wonderful to be able to not only fly in space, have a career, but also have kids. And I think back then, we were just beginning to understand that women could have careers and families, and it was tough. I mean, it, it takes a lot for those of you who have kids out there. Uh, it takes a lot of your time, and you may not make that decision, but for me, it was the right thing. I wanted to stay in the space program, and I did want to have a family. Next slide. Well, here are all our patches. Three of those patches are mine. Top, middle, uh, right on the middle line, and down at the bottom uh, in the middle again. So my husband had five flights. I had three flights. We have all kinds of different patches. You can see the patch on my shirt. And um, we had uh, a wonderful uh, time in the space program with many friends that we get to see every now and then. We had a, let's see, it was the 40, 40th reunion of our class um, just last year. So. Um, Wonderful time, wonderful people, wonderful place to be. But it was time for us to move on. Next slide. I ended up working at Vanderbilt for about 10 years. Believe it or not, I realized that the, one of the things that I had learned at NASA was teamwork, how to work as a team. The doctors and nurses were not working very well as a team back then, and so I was able to help them understand how to better uh, to work as a team, not make mistakes on patients. Next slide. Then I was fortunate enough to move from Vanderbilt into building a company that taught that teamwork concept all across the country, LifeWings. It, I don't participate in it anymore, but um, it is a, a still a, a going company, and they, they have helped make um, healthcare safer, which is a wonderful thing to think about. Next slide. Well, there came a time when I quit traveling and going all around when I thought, I'm going to, I have time now to write a book. You can maybe see when that book was started. I left NASA in 1997, and before I left, I decided I would just write down some things that I could remember. Just the chronology. We did this, we did this, we did this, we did this. I started that in December of 93. My book was published in 2015. So it took a while. I wrote on, um, I think I completed something like 20 legal pads, just writing everything down, writing everything down. Not a story, not a, anything. But I soon learned that I was gonna have to make a story out of it. People just didn't wanna read a timeline. Next slide. So, MTSU is here. You all know MTSU. They had something called a, a, a writing program. And what you did was you went for a weekend and you learned all about writing and then you went home and you, and you wrote something for a month and sent it to somebody who could tell you whether it was good or not and could correct it. I think the first thing I noticed about my mentor's writing was he would write in the margin, how did you feel? Because I hadn't written much about, well, how did I feel when I launched or how did I feel when the Challenger exploded or how did I feel when we left? I hadn't thought about that, and I had to go back and remember how I felt, because that's really important in telling a story, is to tell your personal reaction to it. You may want to just write about history and it was somebody else's life, but the personal side, when you write a memoir, which is what mine is, it's really important to do. Next slide. And I participated, I, I gave interviews, and I did some things that helped me put the story back together. Um, and um, some nice people wrote about me in their literary journals. And so I got the word out that I was going to write a book. Next slide. I had to, since I'm self-published, create a logo for my business. You don't know it, but that shooting star through a circle is the astronaut symbol. And so you can see that I made the female symbol out of the circle. So it was a little bit clever. You have to be clever. I'm not necessarily always clever about designing art. That's not my background. But I think this one is kind of neat. It's on the side of my book. Next slide. And of course, if you're going to write a book, you have to have a book cover. And I always, always liked this picture. I took the bumper sticker for Tennessee. And there I am floating weightless 
in the mid-deck of the space shuttle holding the bumper sticker. And I thought, is there some way we can make that into a book cover? It has nice movement and color and everything. I wonder if we could do that. Next slide. It is it's a work of my heart, and um, it was delightful to be able to do my first book signing right here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I've sold about 5,000 books since then, so it was important to me to get it started right here and continue to do it in um, this place. Next slide. I just wanted you to know that I am, I do have a website. I have pictures on the website. I do a blog uh, that you might enjoy. You can go to astronautraysedden.com, read the blog. Um, the, the, um, the blog posts are short and they're appropriate for kids. So if you have older kids that like to, to read, uh, they can go and read a little short snippet um, some of them are funny, some of them are wise, <laughs> some of them are just kind of cute stories. So those were stories that didn't fit into the book, but I enjoy doing that once a month.